still holding on. Our theme for today is I will rebuild your gates. I will rebuild your gates. We are going to be talking about the rebuilding process. And how many have something in their life right now that God is rebuilding? Yes, yes. You know, uh, and that could be a lot of things, right? But I thank him that he's in the rebuilding business. You know, and it was probably in 1995 that he spoke these very words to me. It was probably one of the more chaotic times in my life. And I chose to say, okay, Lord, I'm willing. You go ahead and do it. And I'll talk about that a little later. But these were the words the Holy Spirit spoke to me over, oh my God, 24 years ago. And he's still doing the rebuilding. How I many you know he's still doing the rebuilding? Amen. And um, so the word today um, is going to connect my life. Also, what's happening now at Shiloh Baptist Church, because we are rebuilding, are we not? Amen. But if you notice, our brother just led the responsive reading, and we see here now that the foundation of the temple had not yet been laid but they were still praising God. Why? Because we're going to talk about it a little bit later. It's not about the building. It's about the inner sanctuary that needs to be built. Someone said, well, Pastor Mike, you know, I only got a few years left here on, on this earth. And I mean, you know the rebuilding never stops. Until we see Jesus, the rebuilding will never stop. Hallelujah. I want to, if you would, put that first... Uh, that chart up there for me. Um, hallelujah. Y'all looking at that chart there. And, and what we're going to do is you're going to, we're going to point out four important phases to the rebuilding process. We're going to look at how it affected Israel and how it should affect you and I. Okay? Um, we're only going to discuss two of those phases today. This will be a three-week series. I will rebuild your gates. Okay? We're only going to deal with two of them. First of all, I just want to point out from the chart what is actually happening. We see here in 537, based on the scriptures we just read, A.D., that Israel was conquered by Babylon, and they were sent into Babylon, and they spent 70 years, we call that 70 years of captivity. Aren't you glad you're no longer captive to the things that used to bind you? Think about how far God has brought you. Isn't it a blessing? When you look back, some of you just get discouraged every now and then because you're not where you want to be. But my God, I thank Him. I've come a long way. Have you not come a long way? Give yourself a hand, praise for how far you've come. But we see here now 70 years of captivity, and then all of a sudden, God opens the doors and they're allowed to go back and rebuild Zerubbabel. Is, is, it basically leads the attack to come back and rebuild the temple, or should we say reestablish worship, okay? So the first thing in the rebuilding process is to establish worship, okay? And then, as time goes on, Ezra comes back and he begins to reinforce or, re or to construct the word of God, okay? And then following that, Nehemiah returns, and he rebuilds the wall, okay? So the first phase I failed to mention was the years of captivity, the willingness to come back to start the rebuilding process. So we got the four W's, willingness, then we have worship, then we have the word, then we have the wall. Y'all with me so far? Okay, so we're only going to deal with two of them today, the willingness to embrace, here it is right here, the willingness to embrace the rebuilding process. Okay, and then the next one is worship must begin at the altar before the glory can return to the building. All right. I'm going to give you the last two, but we're not going to discuss those today. The third one is the establishment of the word as the authority of the rebuilding process. And I'm going to take my time.
time because I had somebody tell me, Mike, you go too fast sometimes, and I never get to finish writing down. I just want to say that to my leaders, y'all, I'm going to start testing y'all every now and then on some of these messages because how many of you know the Word of God is our God? I do not just preach the Word of God just to say I can preach or show I know something. This Word is a part of my life. So I'm giving it to you so you can see success in your life. Right? So we are so fat in America. We can go anywhere and hear a word. We can pick up our phone and hear a word. We can listen to it in our car. We're so fat that the word just means nothing. But how many know, for me, it's everything to me. It's everything to me. So what I give you, I'm showing you, not that my life is in order or perfect, but I walk in the harmony of the Spirit of God. I have things going on in my life. If I were to tell you and paint the picture of things that are going, you say, wow, brother, you have all that going on? Yeah. Is your soul anchored this morning? Then, you know, every now and then when you hear a word, take some of those things with you. I have some people in this church that will call me during the week and want to go over certain things we talked about. Because they believe that the word of God is the guiding light, the guiding force, the authority of the rebuilding process. Hallelujah. All right? We'll start them again. The willingness to embrace the rebuilding process is number one. Willingness. Number two, worship must begin at the altar before the glory can return to the building. Number three, the establishment of the word of God as the authority of the rebuilding process. And then number four, the rebuilding of the wall and gates to establish access control as well as a strong identity. Okay? Today, again, we're only going to deal with the two. So we're going to begin with the willingness to embrace the rebuilding process. Okay? If you notice on that chart, again, we want to refer back to the 70 years of captivity. Okay? And, and what, what, what many of you may not realize, there's a reason why they were there 70 years. It's because they, they neglected what is called the sabbatical years. In other words, for six years, they were to sow and reap. But then the seventh year, the land was supposed to rest. I mean, you know, God is a detailed God. He's a detailed God. And even though, you know, I thank him that I do not walk in presumptuous sin. I thank him that I don't wake up there every day planning and knowing I'm going to sin. I thank him that he has created some order within his tabernacle, but my God, some of the details get difficult sometimes because God is a detailed God. And when he told them during their time in the wilderness that you're to allow that land to rest, you're to take as much as you can for six years, and the seventh year that land is to rest. Well, from the time they entered the promised land to the time of their captivity was 490 years. They failed to honor for the sabbatical year each and every year it came up. So that's why they were in captivity 70 years, because that land is so blessed that God now said, I'm going to give it. So, you, know, you can either give it or he'll, or he'll come take it. <laughs> right? God said, you didn't let the land rest? Well, guess what? 70 years, we're going to let it rest. But aren't you glad for grace? Aren't you glad for mercy? Aren't you glad for second chances? Aren't you glad even though the two by fours have rotted, even though the roof is leaking, that God will still come in and rebuild it? You're looking at a, something that has been rebuilt. I'm not who I used to be. Woo! Hallelujah. I bless his name. But real quick, I want you to just jump over one chapter to Ezra chapter 1. Because remember now, we are talking about there needs to be a willingness to embrace the rebuilding process. When you have to say amen. All right. Let's look at verse 5. Now here we are. I'm going to summarize. This is the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia. And out of nowhere, because God has spoken prophetically through Jeremiah that after 70 years, Israel would be free. No matter how bad it looked, Israel was going to be free. And here we have a ruler, a world ruler, the Spirit of God. You can read it on your own in verse 1. The Spirit of God stirs his heart 
And he is compelled to let the Jews go back to their homeland and rebuild their temple. Talk about a miracle of God. I mean, you know, God needs our prayers when it comes to our political leaders. Maybe if we would stop talking to politics and pray for our leaders, we might get something done. Amen. Because if it don't happen at the top, we're not going to see it down in the back. Right? And here, King Cyrus now, he makes a proclamation that they can go back and rebuild. Look what it says in verse 5. It says, Then the heads of the fathers, the houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, watch this now, with all whose spirits God had moved, arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Y'all see that there, right? So there was a stirring of the spirit of God to, to impact those to go back and rebuild. Verse 6 says, And all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with precious things besides all that was willingly offered. The reason why I'm reading this scripture is because when it comes to the, the rebuilding process, there needs to be a willingness. Okay? Some of us, we still have areas in our life and we just say, well, God, I don't know. I'm just, I don't want to rebuild that yet. And there's got to be a willingness to allow God the access to rebuild. And in 1995, when my life was chaotic, and so many things were around me, so many areas of temptation. I said, okay, God, I'm willing to allow you to rebuild in my life, to rebuild me. And how many remember the day when you finally gave it over? When you finally said, okay, I'm tired of carrying this. I'm tired of drinking this. I'm tired of smoking this. I'm tired of being angry about this. I'm tired, Lord, come in and rebuild. There needs to be a willingness to say, Lord, rebuild. And some of us are carrying some things and we just carry them and carry them and carry them every day. Some of us, we have uh, uh, certain ways of doing things. And I'm talking to myself. I don't want you to think I'm exempt. But there has to be a willingness for us to say, Lord, rebuild. Hallelujah. So I'm here to tell you, he's rebuilding in my life. He's rebuilding it. And you know what? It may not be happening as fast as I would like it, but he has proven himself so many times that, I, that I'm going to wait on the Lord Amen. because I know he's faithful. Hallelujah. All right, so we talked about the willingness to embrace, okay? They were willing. Now watch this now. This was a 500-mile journey from Babylon back to Jerusalem. 500-mile journey. Then on top of that, they knew they were going to have to labor when they got there. Matter of fact, Ezra, when Ezra returns, we're not going to talk about him today, Ezra, it took five months for him to get back. Some of us would have bailed out just, just thinking about the trip, let alone going back and rebuilding the city. Hallelujah. And I saw in one scripture here, it says where they all came together. They, they went back to their cities, but they all came together as one in the nation of Jerusalem to rebuild and ignite worship. All right? So number one, the willingness. And now number two, the second phase. Worship must begin at the altar before the glory can enter the building. Quickly go back to chapter 3. And I'm going to start reading at verse 1. You have it say amen. And when the seventh month had come, the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered together, watch this now, as one man to Jerusalem. Remember I was just saying how they were in their cities. But their focus is different. Their focus is not on their crops, the rebuilding their homes. Their focus is we got to come together and we got to get back to worship. We got to come back and begin to offer sacrifices to God. We got to get back and provoke his presence. We have been through hell, y'all, and God has revived us. We got to get back. We got to leave our homes every now and then and get back and offer sacrifices to God. 
Because the rebuilding process means nothing without worship. Hallelujah. Without worship. Verse 2, then it says, Jeshua, the son of Joseph, and his brother, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren arose and built the altar of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries. Now I'm going to stop there for a second because remember now the third phase, it, the fourth phase, which we're going to do in a couple of weeks, the rebuilding of the wall is to establish access control. So the wall wasn't built at this time. There was no access control. But either way, their priority was worship. Okay? All right? So they set the altar on its basis. In other words, they took the altar, built the platforms, and they began to offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening burnt offerings. So now, if you were walking around the city, can you give me that next photo there, uh, window? If you were walking around the city and you looked toward the east, you would see the offering of God, the aroma of God. That was the first thing you would see if you were looking at the city was worship. It didn't matter about the foundation. It didn't matter about the temple. They wanted to connect with God. They wanted to make sure that the intimacy of God was in place. Because worship is the most important thing that we need in our life. And I thank God for the fact that he's first in my life. Hallelujah. We bless his name. Now look at verse 6 of chapter 3. It says, from the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, although the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. There was no building. They said, we need to establish worship. There are 168 hours in a week. We are in church for probably about an hour and a half. Right? That's it. So if we are relying on church to carry us through this life, we got a problem, right, y'all? Hallelujah. We, that's a problem if your whole spiritual intake is coming to church. Every now and then, you can shut the door and just say thank you. Every now and then, you can ride your car and sing praises. Matter of fact, I don't think there's a day that shouldn't go by where you shouldn't at least take a few minutes just to say, Lord, thank you for another day. God, God, what I do, bless my family. Just talk to him a little bit. Shouldn't be a day where we can't read a psalm or a scripture or something. There's no reason why we can't do that. Why? Because worship is the most important aspect. Amen? God bless his name this morning. When you look at this image here now, what are they doing? They're worshiping God, and there's no building. Hallelujah. Why? Because we blew it when we had the buildings. Boy, I tell you, we got a lot going on today. <laughs> No, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to press my way. I want to finish that in the testimony. All right. Last point I'm going to make. The problem was not in the fact that they had lacked worship. The problem was they were not unified in their worship. Notice verse 11 through 13, the last scriptures I'm going to read in chapter 3. It says, and they sang responsibly. Why? Because the foundation was set for the temple. Praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercies endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the family houses, old men, watch this, who had seen the first temple, the temple was laid before.
before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound, the sound was heard afar off. If you look at this image, what you see is you see people praising God and embracing the fact that worship, my connection to God, is everything. But you see those who are weeping, crying, because they remember the days of old and they remember the glamour and the glit, grit of the, of, of the previous temple. How many know it's not about the building? Those that are lifting their hands are basically saying, God, we got to get it right with you. It ain't about that building. We thank you that you have revived us. You, your word has brought us back home safely. We can again become a nation. We can again worship freely. We thank you for that. Then you have those over there that are focused more on the building and what we lost. I don't have time to focus on what I lost. I don't have time to focus on the mistakes I made. How many know God has already cleansed and washed and healed and delivered you from that? Why are we reverting back when we got his glory ahead of us? I don't know about you, but I'm headed toward the glory. The rebuilding process. Hallelujah. In 1995, I was going to one of the largest churches in the area. I was prosperous had it all, but my worship wasn't intact. And the devil came in and he came in through that big church. I'm not even going to mention any, but there was a lot of sin in that church. I mean, it don't matter how glamorous the building is. It's the heart and the worship of the people in the building. We can rebuild all we want, but if we don't rebuild in the sanctuary of our heart, when we get to the building, the glory won't show up. Yeah, I'm going to this church, thousand member church. You can't, I mean, they had everything. In my life, oh man, I had the homes, the cars, the whole nine, but my worship wasn't where it was. The devil came in and he did a number. And at that point in time, I'm looking at all these avenues of temptation. I mean, you know, when you're going through divorce and separation, the devil's sitting there on every side, telling you, go this way, go that way. But I said, Lord, no. My worship wasn't where it was, where it needed to be. But I'm going to say yes to the rebuilding process. Come on in and rebuild me. I lost my home. I stopped going to that church. I lost a lot of things, but I gained Jesus. How many of you even know you lost something, you gained something because you found him? If you got Jesus, you got it all. I got Jesus, I got it all. You got Jesus, you got it all. And all of a sudden, God began the rebuilding process in my life. In 1995, I was just a Christian. I had no intention of being a pastor. I had no intention of being in leadership. I just said, Lord, I'm all in because the devil robbed me once, but he's not robbing me again. Some of y'all keep letting the devil come through the same window instead of locking the window. Some of y'all going through things in your marriage. Some of you dealing with your kids. Some of you intensifying your worship so you can get a word from God. And you can just wait on him because he'll handle it. Amen? Amen? And God began to rebuild me. He didn't give me a new home right away. He didn't give me a new car. He began to rebuild me. Your stuff means nothing if your worship ain't where it needs to be. And all of a sudden, I began to trust God. I began to handle my separation and divorce according to his will, his will and his way. I began to handle my kids, even though things were going on. I trusted and I leaned on him. And there were times when God didn't make sense. How many know it doesn't make sense? His ways are not your ways, neither is the thought your thoughts. But I will yet trust him. I will trust in the Lord until I about worship now. He began to teach me how to trust. And then I began to decrease. I got sin out of my life. Yes. See, sin is a, a, a factual worship. See, when you look at this image, you have folks that said, Lord, I'm all in. I don't care about the building. I'm all in with you. I got 
can honestly say that I'm so blessed to serve with the members of Shiloh Baptist Church because y'all know it ain't about the building. Over the last three or four months, when I ride in our, into our parking lot, I look at that church and I say, my God, this church looks gloomy. It's got mildew on the side because I was going to power wash it. Obviously, we're not doing no landscape. And I watch y'all every Sunday come in with your loving spirit, greeting each other. And we have a hot time in the Lord, don't we? It don't matter what the building looks like. It's about our work. Hallelujah. And now we are rebuilding. But we need to let God be built here. So when we get back there, the glory will show up. Don't you want the glory? 